Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It really is my great pleasure to welcome you here today. On the eve of uh, the first Hales Day ever uh, um, at the uh, COP climate conference, this is really a landmark moment and a critical recognition that actually we must place Hales at the heart of climate action. Two years ago, a number of us um, were in the room in Glasgow for the COP26, where we launched the Sustainable Market Initiative Health Systems Task Force in the presence of His Majesty uh, King Charles, when he was actually uh, Prince of Wales. I'm really grateful to His Majesty for his leadership and his convening power and for sowing the seeds of this collaboration, which really has flourished over the last uh, few years and his support has been really fundamental to our progress. We're delivering on our commitment with concrete action to really help accelerate the delivery of uh, net zero health system. We started by diagnosing the problem and knowing that about 5% of uh, global carbon emissions come from the healthcare sector, actually up to 8% in some developed countries. And there is a, an a ironical uh, aspect to it because we are in this industry to help patients but on the other hand, we also potentially hurt patients through uh, global warming, uh, pollution, carbon, and leading to, uh, as we all know, uh, cancers, uh, respiratory disease, uh, et cetera. So we chose to, uh, analyzing the problem, we chose to focus on three things. First of all, decarbonizing the supp our supply chains mm -hmm. and the patient care pathways. We uh, decided to look at how do we leverage digital innovation uh, to reduce uh, carbon emission across, uh, again, the healthcare system. And we also uh, uh, more recently started looking at uh, consumer health and well-being. Each company over the last few years has made enormous progress, and I can only tell you a few examples of what as a company at AstraZeneca we've done. Even though the company doubled in size since 2015, we have reduced our carbon emissions by 60%. We've reduced our water consumption by 20%. We've reduced our waste production by 20%. And we are not the only one uh, company doing this. All the companies involved in the SMI have done enormous progress. We launched uh, two uh, biogas programs, one in the UK, one in the US, in partnership with Vanguard. Uh, in uh, Sweden and in, the, in China, we actually started building uh, wind farms in collaboration with other industries uh, that work with us, uh, outside pharma actually, uh, to share access to uh, green, uh, green energy. We're building uh, solar panels wherever uh, we, come, we come. And now at uh, COP28, I'm really delighted to say we've also worked very collaboratively across the uh, industry uh, to partner with energy providers, and we have announced uh, a partnership that will uh, enable, to enable us to scale renewable power in China and in India to provide green energy to, uh, to our own supply chains, but also uh, our partners across uh, the sector. This is key because if you look at the totality of uh, carbon emissions uh, across the healthcare sector, about 50% come from us, pharma companies or medtech companies, suppliers to the, the system itself. And the other 50% come from uh, healthcare delivery and, of course, mostly hospital, hospital care. Um, and, of course, we all know that China and India are a critical part of the supply chain of the uh, pharmaceutical industry and, and the medtech industry. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, Emma Wamsley, the CEO of uh, JSK, for her leadership of the effort in India where they have a large presence and JSK has been leading the effort trying to put together this collaboration to deliver green energy uh, to our supply chain in India. And I'd like to thank all the other companies that have participated to, in the effort in India, but also very much in China, alongside our team in, in China. These partnerships have the potential to save 120,000 tons of carbon. It's comparable to taking 25,000 cars off the road. And that really is showing that it can be done. Uh, we've proven that we can move the needle as individual companies, but also if we work together in, in collaboration across the sector. Um, and as Paul Hudson, and, uh, from, who is the CEO of Sanofi and Paul, will uh, join us in a minute, and Fiona Hatshead, who is the uh, head of the Sustainable Healthcare Coalition, will uh, ac actually outline uh, a little later. We're also making progress to increase transparency of the environmental, environmental footprint of our medicines. 
and, and uh, healthcare delivery. Nothing like this has been uh, seen before, so it really is great progress also in providing transparency to what we are doing. So I'm really proud that together as an industry, but also beyond the industry, we've worked with the WHO, we've worked with the NHS in the UK, we've worked with academic institutions, as you heard from the video a few minutes ago, and now we are working with Victor Zhao and the team in, in the US uh, in collaboration. Together, we're really showing that uh, we can actually make progress, uh, not only uh, in, in a few countries, but across the world, in Europe, in the US, in China, but also in Africa. So if you are in our industry, you have to be an optimist because innovation, research, and development is very risky, as we all know, and, and you have to be an optimist and, and, and really also be resilient and persistent, and, and you have to accept that things come, progress comes in steps. Everything is not going to be perfect in, uh, on day one, so you have to be persistent, resilient, and go through challenges and difficulties and hurdles and uh, uh, progress as you go along, and that's what we are doing. And of course, we often think we're not progressing as fast as we would like to, um, because uh, this issue is an urgent issue. We all know this is a health crisis uh, beyond being a, a, a climate crisis, and so there is urgency to do something. But Definitely, I think we're moving in the right direction. And I feel personally that at least in our sector, there is uh, momentum, the momentum is growing. And I'm, I participate in the uh, uh, sustainable market initiatives uh, as a whole. Uh, this is a, a group of people that is, that is led by Brian Monihan, who is the chairman and CEO of uh, Bank of America. And there's a number of task forces across various industries, airline, as you can imagine, banking, finance, and others. And I think there is a momentum that is growing across uh, the private sector, and but also governments, of course, that we need to act with urgency. So today I'm uh, really delighted to uh, welcome Nisia, who is the uh, health minister in Brazil, and uh, he is very committed, uh, together with the government of Brazil, to address this important issue ahead of, our, uh, pre of your presidency of uh, the G20 and the COP30 uh, in Brazil. I'm really so pleased that uh, you can uh, join us uh, today, um, and I'd like to give the floor to you, Nisia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pascal Suryo. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, it's very important for Brazilian Minister of Health uh, to reinforce the common vision uh, between public and private sector in uh, them to foster the objectives of sustainability and uh, building climate resilient health systems. Thank you for the invitation and the honor of being part of this distinguished panel. I'm compelled to start directly by saying how important it is to build a strong global governance and leadership to strengthen health systems. We know how difficult it is to build resilient health systems that is at the same time concern about access and coverage and responsive to all people's health needs. Brazil has been doing that and has built a solid basis that survived the COVID-19 pandemic and the study on its feet to build back the confidence of Brazilian people in science and a better future. However, the crisis we are, we are facing now with climate change is much greater in nature and it's very important to think about this. We, we have fall short of implementing the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, as our heads of state and government have time and again committed to, if you don't sort this out. Therefore, building a sustainable and resilient health system is not a matter of choice, it's a matter of necessity. It's urgency, it speaks for itself. No long talks are needed. It's rather sufficient to look at the number of disasters that global warming has already caused 
on or intensified in Brazil, all six two cities in the Amazon declare a state of emergency due to extreme drought in the past months. In October, the health ministry allocated an extra amount of 225 million in Brazilian reais for Amazon municipalities in order to strengthen health system. The contradictions that people living in the lar largest water reservoir in the world were left without water, and many of them became completely isolated because transportation depended on rivers as well. A complex emergency response was implemented, and the vaccines, medication, and mainly water had to be taken to the affected area. Meanwhile, strong winds and heavy rains, unknown Brazilian history, flooded seats in the Brazilian south. The state of Rio Grande do Sul, for instance, alone have, was affected by a very intense crisis. Aging hospitals and most of the basic care units were damaged by the extreme floods. The national force of our health system has been mobilized and we are additionally providing humanitarian assistance to victims. The health sector, I think, cannot do it alone. It's impossible an intersectorial dimension perspective. And it's important to think about the role of health in mitigation actions. In this perspective, I think that the industrial sector has a very important role, and I would like to mention the very good efforts by AstraZeneca, as you, Dr. Pascal, had mentioned. And we are had, uh, organizing a very large scope for Brazilian health complex for health in the same perspective good practices, green vision about the health sector. Brazil has committed at the highest level possible to end several socially determined diseases by eliminating them as a public health problem. Many of them are vector-borne and sensitive to climate. Actions are planned and we will need to talk into consideration this extra layer of problem. I end by saying that the Minister of Health from Brazil is committed to making the health system in Brazil, uh, SUS, as you know, a sustainable and climate resilient health system. We are paying a high price, but we are not the ones who mostly cause global warming. That is the reason financing mechanisms must be put in place for a just transition to protect the planet, but also all people on the, on the planet, not only a few who already have access to the resources to do it. That is the commitment of Brazilian government and my vision as Brazilian Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Anissia. It's really a pleasure to have you here. and. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. We all know how beautiful Brazil is and uh, how important Brazil and the Amazon is to all of us to, to continue to breathe and live a healthy life. So it's really great to see Brazil connect uh, climate change with health and taking action. So with this, I'd like to introduce Victor Zhao, who is the president of the National Academy of Medicine in the United States. And Victor has been... Uh, very uh, active leading a collaborative across the healthcare sector in the US working also on climate change. So Victor, thank you very much for your leadership of this effort in the US and the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Pascal, and what a great honor it is to be with this distinguished panel, Minister Nasir, it's good to see you again and of course, we wait for Tedros to show up and he will. Uh, <laughs> So, um, you know, yesterday we, I was in a session with Minister Nasir, and we clearly pointed out that uh, climate change is a public health crisis. 
and equity crisis. And that's very clear. At COP26, the effort was first time recognizing health as an important issue is to bring together human health to the forefront of climate change. At the time, there were 70 ministers of health who committed to two things, strengthening climate resilience and secondly, low carbon emission from the health systems. And of course, out of that was the creation of the Alliance of Transformative Action on Climate Change, attached in order, led by WHO, to support these changes. Now, as I look at what's happened this past two years, I think we should be quite encouraged because many, many countries, many systems are moving towards decarbonization. Certainly, we know the work in Brazil, the work in Egypt, in uh, Malawi, in the UAE, United Kingdom. In our country, the Biden administration created an Office of Climate Change and Equity under the Health and Human Services. And it's led by Rachel Levine, who's the Assistant Secretary of Health. And the effort is to try to mobilize in a voluntary fashion uh, as many health care organizations to join in the decarbonization. So there was a White House pledge, which I was present and spoke, and we now have over 100 organizations representing 837 hospitals, but it's not enough. And so now there's a next round, in fact, of pledge in order to create more. But I think what's really interesting in my mind in this journey is the public-private partnership. You heard from Pascal, the SMI. The SMI, which is truly bringing together a lot of private companies and public sector, including WHO, UNICEF, and others, have created a roadmap to accelerate decarbonization. So I've actually participated, Paul, in Paul Hudson's expert panel. And of course, the effort is to look at uh, care pathways, life cycle assessment, clinical trials, and digital innovation. With that, we are so excited because at the National Academy of Medicine, this is a shared vision. We have very similar ideas, and there's complementary actions. So I reached out to David Pryor and then Pascal, and we've joined forces, and there's a great partnership together. So let me tell you what's happening in our country. Because of this issue and because of who we are as an academy, we have, uh, may, may or may not know, that we have, we're founded by uh, Abraham Lincoln and Congress to advise the nation independently. So we have great convening power, and of, because of that, and Amanda Stout is here, we have a cross-academy initiative called the Crossroads. But at the National Academy of Medicine, we focus on how to look at this issue, and we create a grand challenge, which we have five pillars. Communication, very obvious how important it is to tell the public and to educate our healthcare workers on this issue, research innovation, system transformation, equity, and of course, net zero health systems. And I'm gonna talk about this. So we launched a thing called the Action Collaborative, in many ways, complementary and supportive and collaborating with the Biden administration. So of this collaborative, or decarbonizing the US health sector, we have the secretary, assistant secretary, who's overseeing Biden administration's effort as a co-chair with me, along with Sir uh, Andrew Whitty, that many of you know, previous CEO of GSK, and now the United Health Optum CEO, and of course also George Barrett, former CEO of Cardinal Health, a big supply chain. We created this collaborative as a true public-private partnership because we realized none of us can do this alone. Pascal just pointed out that a significant portion comes from the care delivery, but also a large portion comes from manufacturing, biopharmaceutical device and supply chain. So together we have created this collaborative with hospitals, health systems, clinicians, biopharma, device, insurance company, education, and the federal government. We have over 200 leader participants, including of course from Medtronic, GSK, AstraZeneca, many others, along with some of our leading hospitals and others. And so we took a step back and say, how do we actually mobilize the entire country? Of course, it's nice to say we want to decarbonize, but if you don't coordinate 
and collective work, you'll never achieve those goals. So as a result, we actually took a step back and asked the question, very similar to SMI, what are the four important areas we said? One, of course, is healthcare delivery. How do you look at care redesign pathways to actually enable less use utilization of high energy uh, diagnostic and treatment, more virtual care, create new pathways? How about also waste reduction, circular economy, and anesthesia gases? So that's one thing we're working on together. The whole collaborative made a commitment of 50% reduction by 2030 and net zero by 2050. The second area, of course, is education communication. Realize, just like what you've done in SMI, unless we educate our healthcare workers on this issue, we're not going to be able to mobilize the whole workforce towards this. So with the accrediting agency for medical school, nursing school, the CEOs of those agencies and others, we're together now creating common curriculum, looking at gaps and pathways, and looking forward. And then, of course, there's the industry side, a very important in terms of supply chain, co-chaired by the head of the Alliance of Supply Chain, as well as Medtronic and others. They look at the following issue. Um, what are the best practices? How do you look at policy and regulatory changes? Turns out this is a very important issue. Every time you want to innovate in manufacturing or supply chain, you have to go through FDA and start proving all over again. So we got FDA involved with this conversation. And of course, standards and measurements. Really difficult to look at scope three measurements. So we're working together on this. And of course, supply chain targets. I was speaking to Paul Hudson, I asked him, how many supplies do you work with? Say 90,000? So imagine that you have to create procurement standards and others. So I know that Biden's administration with NHS is working on those standards along with our uh, collaborator. And finally, we talked about that yesterday at the Brazilian session, you have to give incentives. You can't simply say to healthcare providers, go do it. So we have a group that works on finance, incentive, and metrics. It's actually co-chaired by Don Berwick, who used to be the CMS administrator, and Liz Fowler, who's the, now the head of Medicare Innovation, and John Perlin, the head of accreditation, John Commission. And so we're now looking at how do you do value-based payment for outcomes measurement? How do you look at uh, uh, um, financials um, incentive, and importantly, the Biden administration has passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and we, of course, work with HHS closely to educate all hospitals and others to take advantage of the grants and the support you can get from the Infl Inflation Reduction Act. So all told, we've done a lot of work on creating carbon clinics, a climate, climate journey map, and assistance in the application of IRA. So where are we going from here? It's important to realize we're still a very voluntary uh, convening, but you heard about a thousand. So we've decided that we're going to have a national effort, along, in fact, with the Biden administration, and we're launching what we call a movement. And this movement, building on existing efforts, such as Health World Harm and others, will bring people in, just like the days of patient quality and safety, when Don Berger started. Nobody would say, oh, you know, my hospital's safe. I don't want to measure anything. They started a movement called uh, 100,000 Lives Campaign. Using the same model, we are now bringing hospitals in voluntarily, hopefully reach thousands of them, of which a group of them will be measuring and implementing and others will join over time. So that's where we are. Now, it's important to point out that our role also is to address equity. And of course, we discuss this in a very important way. As health systems, we can reach out to a community who are in need of health equity and bring together the um, policymakers to look at how we can help the communities. And we have a program called the Climate Community Network. Also, we talked about the importance of our voice in influencing health policy. Really important to have health in all policies and of course, finally bring together agriculture, 
transportation, city planning, and uh, energy together under one system to look at the impact on uh, human health. So that's where we are. So I want to end by saying this is a very exciting time in COP28. And we want to call to action that all health systems commit to this and that we're going to reach those goals together. It's a public-private partnership because all sectors have to work together. Also, I think it's important for us to be the voice to the public to let people be aware of the impact on human health so there's more support, more energy. It's important that we influence policy. It's important we do more research to create more information. And finally, of course, important to get financial support in the form of a Global Health Adap Adaptation Fund. Thank you very much. So let me um, ask David Shukman to come over the, the podium. He's now going to moderate the session. And thank you for stepping in when Vanessa Red, pardon me, Kelly was not able to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.